challenges in life to give it meaning. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about, is the perspective. These, this idea of new perspectives. Right? So hopefully today I'm going to give you a new perspective on leadership, kind of how to think about life. And originally, I was going to give the presentation like this. <laughs> but then I realized there wasn't a stage, and I get lightheaded, and I'm going to pass out, and that wouldn't be good for anybody. So instead, I'm going to give it here on my feet. I'm going to start with a story. So, a couple years ago, it was one of the most beautiful places in the world. In central Vietnam, the top of this mountain, 22 kilometers high, in the middle of a national forest, national park, jungle, essentially. And I was there with my then fiance, and we're hiking. Right, and then along this path, about the three or four hours, there's this big river through this mountain. There's cascading waterfalls, 30, 40 feet high. Absolutely stunning. We're the only people up there. I don't see a single other person the entire time we're out there. We're at the bottom of this fifth waterfall, up, upstream to us. I couldn't imagine a better place to be in the world. Except there's one problem. We were in the middle of a flash flood. I was on one side of the river, she was on the other side of the river. And there was no path across. The obvious question is, why are you on one side and <coughs> she's on the other? How did that happen? So we had hiked originally, crossed that river, and the way to cross it, we had these stone steps that are about 18 inches apart. You kind of jump from one to the other to the other as you cross the river. And we kept going on another hour or so. We got to another waterfall, 900 feet tall. Unbelievable, just the two of us. We hiked down to the bottom, get at the bottom, enjoy our time there. All of a sudden, thunder starts, right? It starts raining. We're like, uh-oh, we need to start going. Because not only are we in Vietnam where you know it's wet? You know it rains a lot. But this specific location, Bok Mall, the name of the mountain, it, it gets the most rain of anywhere in Vietnam. <laughs> so we kind of start booking it, but 900 feet up a waterfall is a long way. So it takes us probably an hour, hour and a half to get back to this river we had initially crossed right in front of this big waterfall. Only problem is those steps we had crossed, they're submerged. You can't even see that. It's probably a foot two feet below the surface of the water. So we're trying to cross at various points. We can't go too far downstream, because A, there's that 900 foot waterfall, and B, on the opposite side, there's actually a cliff line up to about 15 or 20 feet. So we have this small area to cross the river. And oh yeah, the only, people who, the only person actually knows where we are is our driver, who we were supposed to meet an hour ago, and he doesn't speak any English. <laughs> so we're kind of in this bind of how do we get across the river. Like I said, we tried multiple places, couldn't do it. So finally, I figured out where the stones were. I got down, I faced the river, and I kind of did this really slow stone to stone across. I get to the, initially it's at my shoulder level. So I get to the middle and it's over my head. And it takes all of my strength, literally, to go from stone to stone and get to the other side. I'm like, all right, got here. All right, wife, your turn. Only problem is, she's 5'5". 
quite hot. <laughs> and so she tried a couple times, two or three times to get across, and she'd get towards the middle, and she'd reach out, and you could just see her body going backwards. She was just getting exhausted. She just goes back to the side. And now we're on opposite sides of the river, trying to figure out what to do. I'm terrified. I can see her across the way, but she's terrified. So I'm like, all right, think back to your military. Right? What, do you, what should you do? Basic training. You know, officer training school, squadron officer school, deploy, do all sorts of missions. I should know what to do here. I sit there and think and came up with nothing. So I did the next best thing. I went to childhood Hollywood movies. I found a branch and I broke it down to those four feet long and <laughs> waded out into this river. Because right in front of the waterfall, there was a pool. Right? And the side I was on, it was actually dammed up to create the pool. On the side she was on, water was just rushing by. So I waded out almost halfway. I got my branch, and I yelled at her because the waterfall is right there. Count of three, you're going to jump. You're going to grab the branch, I'm going to pull you in. Right? <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, okay. So, you go one, two, three, and she jumps. I don't know if it was adrenaline. I don't know if it was, you know, Michael Jordan decided to come in in that moment to give her a little boost. But she actually bypasses the branch. I toss it aside and I grab it. And then my legs go out and we go shooting down the river. <laughs> and all I can think about is I'm not letting her go. And how do I keep her head above the water? And as we're going down, she jams her foot into the ground and we create enough leverage to get up and we stumble to the side. We're on the right side of the river. I have all this emotion welling up and then I pick her up and I give her a big kiss. I say, I have to love you. <laughs> she looks back at me and she goes, I love you too. That was dumbfounded. So, the, the question you should have right now is, hey, why were you dumbfounded? What the heck does it have to do with leadership? So, the dumbfounded part was, when I said, I love you, it wasn't that husband and wife sort of love I met. And that's how she met. And I did love her that way. I just didn't have the words to express the emotion I was feeling. So one, I was so proud of her. That she, in that moment, on that bank, had the courage the vulnerable, to put herself in a vulnerable position to overcome her fear and actually jump. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. I was so proud of her. And two, it was a little more selfish reason. Because she had given me the ultimate act of trust. Right? She had put her life in my hands. She had trusted me with her life. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you about, is trust. Not building trust for somebody to put their life in your hands. If you can do that, great. You know? <laughs> but the idea is you're building trust that you have somebody else's best interest in mind, that you're going to do right by them, that you're trustworthy, that you're competent, that you'll do the right thing for your client, for your colleague, for your boss. And with trust, that's everything. Right? We were talking about uh, your friend, right? She started writing. And she was good at it. People started trusting with more and more responsibility. It's the key to all relationships. Think about it. Think about the people you go to in your life, the people you trust at work, at home. Think about how you think of them. You want to be that person. And for me, those two things, trust and leadership, they equate. Leadership is merely building trust. It says acts of leadership are the acts of building trust. Now, we're all lawyers here, so we're going to define some terms, because these can get pretty nebulous leadership. Leadership is not a position of authority, right? The person who is a leader does not mean leadership. I don't care where you fall on an org chart, you can be the lowest person, you can be the highest person, you can display leadership. Right? What I'm going to give you today is a framework to think about building trust, to think about leadership. There's, there's four components to it, and these are principles. It's uh, authority, it's awareness, authenticity, courage, and commitment. I'm going to go through those a little bit more and talk about them specifically. But they're principles, right? That's a 30,000 foot view. It's not a technique, it's not a how to. A technique and how to, that's the immersion, that's the individual. Every single one of us has a different way to become trustworthy. There's no cookie cutter method. So, normally when I work with groups, I work with individuals, it's on a six month period. It's in the big seminar, four hours, eight hours, 16 hours. Because you need to get down to the nitty gritty of what works for you. So I'm going to give you the principles. Another way to think about this, because I deal with lifestyle stuff too, 
is nutrition and health, right? Throw out some names of, of diets. So we got the paleo diet. Anything else? What else you guys think of when you think of diet? Atkins, Atkins diet. South Beach, Mediterranean, right? Vegetarian, vegan, zone, go through the list. All of those are techniques. Right? That's the how-to. This is what you eat. This is what you put in your body. That's a technique. The principle is that 30,000 foot view. Right? Does that make sense? And bones around the subject. Okay, the three principles of nutrition and health. We'll get into you really quickly. One, eat nutritionally dense food. Makes sense? Go ahead and Google that. It's interesting the list that comes up. It's organ meats and then everything, which is interesting. And then you get into the <laughs> vegetables and fruit and lean meats and eggs and nuts and seeds, right? Kind of obvious stuff we all kind of know on some level. So, second one is eat real food, which is nice because it dovetails with nutritionally dense food. Right? And you figure the real food, the stuff that spoils, right? Things without chemicals that isn't processed. And the third principle is don't eat things that are inflammatory to you. Seems very simple. That's where you get into the specifics, right? I have a friend, just give you a quick example. About 18 months ago, but maybe they're all of her life, all of a sudden she starts eating meat. Within a minute or two, becomes nauseous and starts throwing up. Every single time, within a minute or two. Doctors have no idea why. There's a theory she was bit by something, maybe caused it. So if you're on the Atkins diet, where a big component of what you eat is meat, what's she supposed to do? Right? So that's the technique versus the principle, that 30,000 foot view. And that inflammatory part, that's the part that you know, each one of us individually have to figure out. That's, you have skin issues, you have digestive issues, you can do blood work, all that stuff will figure that out. But that is the technique, that's the specifics. Principles are those three. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to, as we lead into the specifics of leadership, or what leadership actually deals with, these four components. We all face two calamities, really, in building trust, in building leadership. That first, it's the calamity of lack of taking space to have reflection, <coughs> introspection, right? It's the idea that you wake up five years, 10 years down the road, you know, how did I get here? Not only how did I get here, but I don't even want to be here. Or I've been in the same job for 10 years and I have never been promoted. I'm not being recognized by my boss. Why not? The answer to that is the reflection, taking space to figure out where you are and where you're going. And that's authenticity and awareness. And the second calamity is that of inaction, right? Everyone here is super smart, all graduate, all lawyers. You can figure this all out, what I'm supposed to do. But why don't I do the things you know you should? Why, aren't, why don't you do promo for a woman work you want to do? How do I get around that? And the answer to that is courage, is commitment. So breaking those, coming back to that, we'll start with um, authenticity. I don't like that word, but it's better than self-actualization, so we'll roll with it. Um, authenticity, what I mean by that is everything that makes up who you are. Right? And that encompasses everything, your experiences, your parents, your siblings, your colleges you went to, the schools you went to, the religion you have, that all kind of combines, the movies, the books you've read, all that kind of combines into the person you are, the character that you have, the values you hold, the beliefs you hold, the interests that you have. Right? And the test, it's called the Batman test. This is the test to figure out your authenticity. So do you put on a mask when you're in certain situations? Are you a different person at work than you are at home? And vice versa. Are you a different person with your friends than you are with your colleagues? And yes, there's a formalism to work. And there's a certain way that you dress, maybe a couple of mannerisms that are different. But the core of who you are, if you dread getting up and going to the work in the morning, maybe there's something about you that's being inauthentic. Maybe there's something you need to reassess. And that's the question. Why are you doing what you do? And why are you doing it in the way you do it? Think about those two things. Are you wearing a mask? I'll give you a quick story, kind of how this dovetails into trust. Is for many, many years, my life was basketball. So I was a little kid up through the teens, uh, played in college, played a little bit afterwards. Along the way, I had a coach, very abrasive, loud. He's one of these people who would throw chairs at friends, he'd throw basketballs at people. 
He was escorted out of gym on multiple occasions by the police. I'm like, this sort of guy, right? <laughs> the interesting thing is, when he wasn't in the basketball realm as a head coach, he was the most laid back, calm, thoughtful person you would ever see, ever meet. What he had done is he had modeled. Right? We're talking about when you're a little kid and you're growing up, you model your parents. He had never been a head coach before. So what he did is he modeled the best coach he knew. This was his college coach, the Hall of Famer, who had the same kind of abrasive attitude. But it was inauthentic for him. And it shone through. Nobody, it was nobody who played for him trusted him. We didn't think he had his best interest in, the, in our minds, or in his heart for us. We didn't think he was making the right decisions. And what was the result? We all underachieved. Many times we were supposed to finish first or second in our league, and we end up finishing fifth or sixth. As you can see through that, if you're wearing a mask, people will see through that, whether at home or at the office. Can you see through? And the second is awareness. It's kind of the flip side of authenticity. So authenticity is looking at yourself. Awareness is projecting it out. It's looking at other people, their values, their beliefs, their interests. Where do you work? Does your boss know what your biggest interest is? I Meaning what you, why you took that job? Do you know why you were hired? Were you just there to fill a position? Are you being mentored for partnership? A leadership role, right? Your colleagues, do you know why they're there? Think about this, you, you're at your firm for five, six years and then a new colleague comes in. The only thing they're interested in is learning this specific area of They're bankruptcy nerds. This is their thing. They love bankruptcy. They want to learn everything they can. What if you know this? That that's, that's their primary reason for being there. And you go up to the, your colleague and say, hey, 30 minutes a week. Come by my office. We're going to have a little lesson. I'm going to teach you a different area of bankruptcy every single week. A, they're going to be very grateful. And B, they're going to trust you. And that doesn't go away, that's for life, right? As long as you don't screw that up, you have now built a bond of trust. That can't be broken, or won't be broken. <coughs> that goes up the line to bosses, that goes to clients you're dealing with. If you know what their real interest is, it doesn't matter, I'm not judging what it is. It could be money, maybe it's making the most money you can. You, can. Right? you have student debt, you have a mortgage, you have kids on the way, okay, but at least know that. And those around you should know that. That's authenticity and awareness. Yeah. And that's kind of talking about that, that first part, that introspection, right? that reflection, both on yourself and others. It's taking that time, that space. And that could be on a daily basis. You have an interaction with your boss. You go back to your office for five minutes and think, was that myself? Was that authentic in that situation? Do I know what his interest was when we talked? What we're really trying to get out of this to be on a monthly basis. But you need to reassess where you're at in your life, in your day to day, so you don't get to that position where 10 years from now you're saying, I don't want to be here. Why was I here? Why am I here now? So the, ex the second calamity we face is that of inaction. I believe that that invisible force, that drive, Activated is the most important thing you can have. That emotion is the key to life. It doesn't matter what it is, something you feel passionate about, you're committed to, you'll run through a brick wall for it, right? You'll figure out a way to do that. And the, two way, and the way you think about this, and the way you get there is courage and commitment. So courage we normally think about as a physical aspect. Making yourself vulnerable. My wife jumping off the side of the, the river. Uh, we read the newspaper several weeks ago. There's a couple military guys uh, with a buddy in France. Okay? Metro guy comes out with a gun. They charge him. They don't run away. They don't hide. They charge him, subdue him. One of them got stabbed several times. They survived. They prevented what could have ever been a mass shooting. We think of that, that physical courage. And one of the definitions of courage is overcoming fear, right? It's not that you don't feel fear, it's overcoming fear. And if you strip back the layer, 
a little bit more, you get to vulnerability, which doesn't really equate to courage and vulnerability. But that's what it is, right? It's physically being vulnerable. But also there's a step beyond that. It's the emotional part. It's the standing in front of a group and saying, judge me. Right? Standing up in a meeting and saying something that's contrary to the, the group thing. It's putting yourself up there to be judged. This happens in all aspects of life. Think about the divorcee who's going out on their first date again. Right? That's vulnerability. That's courage. Let me give you an example. Uh, my early years in the military, a young lieutenant, been in for six months. I get to my first base, Little Rock, Arkansas. And in the office, the office is about 20 or 30 people. And one of the components of being a military, in, in being in the military, is you have to maintain a certain level of physical fitness, right? PT test. You got to do push ups, sit ups, do some running. And there was senior enlisted in my office, people who've been for 18, 19 years. My boss has been for 19, 20 years. All of them were overweight. We would go out to PT in the morning. We do our calisthenics, right? Do some push-ups, and then we go run. And every single time, <laughs> they jog a half lap, and then they'd walk for the next 20 minutes. These people have been for 18. And it drove me crazy. It drove me nuts every time. Because as soon as you get into the military, especially the Air Force, you're hammered into right integrity first, excellence in all we do. This is our core values. But they were sitting there giving an example to 18, 19 year olds, to myself, who's brand new to the Air Force, of, hey, this is the minimum we need to do. We just need to get by. So this went on for a couple weeks, and every time that was driving me nuts. So we get to a staff meeting, and at the end of it, our boss goes around, anybody have anything, 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 anything? Finally, stood up, got my little soapbox, and I called everyone out, not by name. And I said, this is what I see. People are walking. Right, you're supposed to, we're supposed to be setting an example for everyone else. By doing the bare minimum, we're settling for mediocrity. And I went on and on and on. Um, and afterwards, I sat down, and there was silence. Right? And I'm like, oh no, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Somebody's going to come in and smack me down. I'm going to get yelled at. Uh, my boss, who is also overweight um, and barely passing her PT test, she wasn't going to like this because you know, it was obvious who I was talking about. I go back to my office, and lo and behold, I get a knock at the door. And one of the senior enlists that comes in, I'm like, okay, I'm about to get it. And she goes, thank you. I needed to hear that. Can you help us? Can you hear it one of her friends? I said, oh, absolutely. Later that week, my boss came in, and she goes, can you help me? Absolutely. So I became the PT leader of our office, and then of the agency. And I also had like 200 people um, leading in PT groups. All because of this one little moment, I'll call it courage, of putting, making myself vulnerable. Right? Building trust. They trusted me at that point. The last thing I'm going to talk about, the last component, is commit commitment. And this one gets kind of technical in the, the definition. Basically, it's giving a shit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that caring, it drives everything else. That's that invisible force. That makes everything else go. I don't care what it is. You want to be the best attorney in the world? Yes, it's possible. If you, if you are committed enough. Right. There's two parts to commitment. It's commitment to the form and commitment to the cause. What I mean by that is you're going to have commitment to the specifics. The form is the skill. It's the day-to-day. -day. Okay. So in the legal profession, that might be being the best writer. You love writing. You can do everything you can to be the best writer because that drives you. For me, when I was playing basketball, I could go out with a basketball and a hoop by myself for hours. And I would sit there and I would just work on footwork. Where do I put my left hand? How does the ball come off my right hand? 
How much do I follow through? What angle? I love that. Think about in your life, what part of being a lawyer do you love? What are you committed to? Is there a part of the form you're committed to? Or is it the cause? You don't need both. If you have both, that's a wonderful thing. Maybe it's the cause, though. The cause of the firm. Maybe you work at an agency. Maybe a nonprofit. That bigger picture, what's the mission, essentially, of who you work with, what you do? Does that drive you? Is that what you're committed to? And if you're not, you need to think about what you, where you have that emotional wellspring. And organize your life. Be authentic. That's what we're coming back to, right? Be in a position where you're authentic to who you are and what, what gives you life. Life is short. So one of those two things, form or cause. I'm just kind of rolling through that whole idea again. The authenticity, awareness, commitment, courage. Now, I'd like to break them up. Because as a lawyer, that's what we like to do, break things into component parts, and then you know, call that everything. But it's non-linear. It's not a linear process, building trust. The meta, the, the big picture is trust. That's the first blanket. Is what actions am I taking? Is how am I living my life? Is that building trust? And if it is, you're in a leadership position. You're exhibiting leadership. So, that in mind, um, that is actually the end. Is there any questions? Um, I'll be happy to take them. I have a question for you. Absolutely. You, you use the example of you kind of, for lack of a better term, calling out your, your uh, I don't know, was your trooper, uh, I, I, I'm messing it up the term, but um, for their lack of physical fitness. What about um, some of us here who work at smaller firms or who work at smaller government agencies who want to get more involved, um, but their firms don't necessarily support doing a lot of pro bono work because it takes away from their, their hours or their, their work at the actual office. Um, how, how would you tell us or give us some tips on confronting or approaching our superiors and asking them, look, this is why this is important and this is why you should be more agreeable to be doing And I think that if we're going to break it down to the, the points I talked about, it's a lot to do with awareness, right? So if you want to do pro bono work, you're already committed to it, right? You're already authentic. This is really what you want to do. But it's, okay, what, are, what is my boss's interest? Right? What, what makes them go? Maybe it's, and this is going to be individual everywhere, maybe it's, I need to get my work done. I'm worried that, hey, if I give you pro bono work, you're not going to have time to do whatever your day-to-day -day responsibilities are. How do you alleviate that? Maybe it's, hey, I actually have to work a little bit more. Coming in an hour early just to give yourself time. Maybe the interests are marketing, promotions. We talked about a little bit earlier with Chris, right? Maybe you try that angle. Is they're concerned with business coming in, right? The biggest, their biggest interest is money. Is how do you turn this pro bono opportunity into marketing for the firm? How do you get the name of the firm out there? as we talked about. So the idea is to figure out what the interests of the person you're working with, of your boss, of the firm, and see how the pro bono work, how you doing this will help out. Maybe it's the experience you're gonna get. I don't have any experience doing X, but this is directly correlative to what we do at work. You're not training me, I'm getting this on my own outside of the office, which is gonna be helpful. Now I have an additional expertise that the office doesn't have, or maybe they're short in the office on this expertise. So it's thinking through the interests of your, of your firm, of your boss. Any other questions, examples, anything kind of want to work through? The last thing I want to, I want to leave with um, is, is a thank you for coming out listening to me today. 
Um, I want to offer everyone here, um, and at your firm, if you want, a free consultation. Normally I charge around $500 for an assessment and a consultation. To you it's free. Um, I'll get everyone's email address. I'll shoot out an email if you're interested. I do leadership, I do lifestyle, as we mentioned previously. I do performance. If anybody is interested, I'd love to talk to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you very much.